So I'm going to finish off now talking about how to be a successful optimist. Because that's hard. And I spend my life finding people who are successful optimists. People like Carl, who do extraordinary things. And I've tried to distill what they have in common, whether it's a teacher like Carl or a great entrepreneur. I've come up with eight principles they all, they all have in common. I want to share them with you to finish off the conference. So let's start. The first thing they have is they're ambitious about the future. They're unashamedly ambitious about the future. Optimism is a moral position. Most of us do not wake up in the morning and think the future can be better and I've got something to do about it. We just try and get on and comply, as Carl says. But everybody gets anything done, understands the future can be better, and then they realize, then it's my job to go and make it so. They are prepared to dream. And today has been about dreamers and dreaming more than anything else. Now, I like to say that uh, Martin Luther King did not stand on the steps of Lincoln Memorial and say, I have a plan. <laughs> okay. He was perhaps the greatest exponent of explaining to people how things could be better whilst also explaining how bad they were. All of his speeches. I have a dream, the most famous one, but I've been to the mountaintop. He's saying, I can show you something better, and now you've seen it, I'm going to give you something to do. Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And so if you don't take anything else from this day, please have beautiful dreams. Because once you have them, you can go and make them real. And what I'm going to do at the end of this, in your booklets, you'll find this page. And what I want you to do, if you feel inclined, is write down each principle and then score yourself against how good you feel you are, say, being unashamedly optimistic about the future. Then if you have a team, how good are you instilling that in your team of people? And then maybe you can score your organization, the place you work, and that will tell you about the culture of the organization. And by the, end, by the time you finish those eight principles, you'll have a very good map of where you need to put your efforts to change the world. Whether it's to work on yourself, personally, or to work on your leadership style, or to work on the culture of your organization. So, score yourself. And you can do this in your head, you like. How good are you? Ten is you're Martin Luther King. One is you're the Daily Mail. <laughs> okay. So, the second principle they all have in common is they engage in projects that are bigger than they are. So, I got this from looking at uh, the work of uh, Daniel Dennett. Daniel's a philosopher and quite a good uh, Father Christmas impersonator. And uh, he said... Uh, one of the occupational hazards of being a philosopher is I get asked difficult questions at parties. So you know what it's like. Whatever profession you work in, you often get asked for free advice. I've got a friend who's a doctor, and every time she goes to a party, somebody drags her into the kitchen and says, can you look at this pimple on my backside? If you work in banking, people, you know, people want free investment advice. If you're a philosopher, it's worse. You'll be, you'll be there to be goes, all right, then. What's consciousness? <laughs> and Daniel goes, it's, it's my night off, really. Leave me alone. I'm having a beer. They've been knowing about that for 2,000 years. He says, another question he gets asked a lot is, what's the definition of happiness? He says, I've got an answer for that. The best definition of happiness is find something more important than you are and dedicate your life to it. Find something more important than you are and dedicate your life to it. And I think some of the people we see on this stage today have definitely embodied that. Whether it was Vicky from NSF or Carl or Inzo, they found something more important. And you could tell they are happy people, despite having to fight some enormous battles. Because the people that only have a project that's the same size as themselves, they're really boring, aren't they? All they can talk about is their kitchen extension and what they're going to do when they retire. You know, they're really dull. I've got a feeling that, you know, that this doesn't happen. <laughs> so score yourself. And score yourself as a leader. And score yourself as an organization. Does it have purpose? Do you have meaning? Do you have something bigger than you? How good are you at doing that and encouraging people to do it? The third principle they all have in common, I think, as again, they've been embodied by the people we've seen here today, is this. They believe that you are what you do, not what you intend to do. So you've all, all had this conversation with yourself, yeah? If only people knew the real me, if only people knew the real me, they'd understand what a kind-hearted, wonderful, you know, emotionally literate, environmentally sensitive person I am. And the only reason that, you know, some of my colleagues might think I'm a bit grumpy or whatever is because, well, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have the budget, I had a difficult childhood, my boss is a Nazi. You know, the, you know we all come up, we come, come up with all these reasons why we're not doing the important things in life. And what I found out was that all the time I used to spend doing that was the time the successful optimists took 
to do whatever they could from wherever they were and just start working. And I want to explain this with perhaps my favorite story of all time, which is the story of a Werner Forsman. And he saved the life of somebody in this room, almost certainly. And he's done that because he invented the um, technique of cardiac catheterization, which, uh, if you don't know, is like the technique of putting a tube into your heart by the circulatory system. Uh, and when he came up with this idea in 1929, accepted medical wisdom was you couldn't even touch the human heart without instantly killing the patient. And he'd seen vets touch animals' hearts, and they said, I don't think that's true. I think we can use this technique to get drugs into the heart or open up a valve, and even now we use it to get cameras into the heart. But no, it was a crazy idea. But he, he came up with it, and he goes to the, the, the hospital, he goes to the people who run the hospital, he goes, um, what's the idea of cardiac catheterization? Can I try it? What do you think their answer was? Yeah, they were kind of like, no. no. Uh, that's so silly, you'll, you'll, you'll kill the patient. And, uh, and relatives hate that, so... Um. <laughs> so, okay, well, uh, I'll tell you what, give me a patient that's terminally ill. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> Just kill him a bit earlier. He says, no, 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 again, not popular relatives. He says, look, I'm so convinced it's going to work, I'll do it on myself. And they said, no, you won't, because we can't afford to lose a doctor. So we are, you, you are banned, you do not do this. So what does he do? He does the only thing I think a sensible physician can do. He tries to seduce the chief nurse. Now, <laughs> why does he try to seduce Gerda Ditson, the chief nurse? Because she has the keys to the cupboard with all the equipment he realized he needs to do this experiment on himself. He's going to do it anyway. And he writes in his autobiography, I started to prowl around Gerda like a sweet-toothed cat around a cream jug. <laughs> anyway, they actually become very good friends. They've got a lot in common. They obviously have a shared interest in medicine. And uh, uh, after a few nights out on the wine, she said, he tells her his big idea, and she says, not only will I give you the keys to the cupboard, I will be your first patient. It's going to be far easier for you to do it on somebody else. So they sneak into the hospital a few nights later. She's tied down to the operating table. He's tapping her arm with some iodine, ready to make an insertion. And he leaves her there, tied up. And he goes into the next room and starts to perform the procedure on himself opens up the key cupboard and starts, gets the equipment out and starts doing it on himself. But he didn't want to hurt her, didn't want to risk her, but he did need the keys. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever tried self-cardiac catheterization. <laughs> uh, you know, it was not easy. And, and, you know, he couldn't get it all the way in. Story of my life, really. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry, I used to be a stand-up, and sometimes I get on the stage, it just happens. Um, anyway, he couldn't, get the, he couldn't get the tube all the way to his heart. So he goes back into the room where Gerda is tied up, and he unties, they have a bit of an argument at this point, and with the help of another nurse, Ava, they push the tube, they think, all the way into his heart so he can feel it. He says, let's get down to the operating theatre, let's take a picture of this, uh, sorry, the x-ray theatre, let's take a picture of this next x-ray, we can prove it works and we're good. They get down to the x-ray theatre, they're confronted by another colleague, a man called Dr. Peter Romeus, who is outraged by what's going on. He's heard that uh, this has been banned, that the authorities don't want to do it, and he's like, this is wrong, you can't do it, I'm sorry. So he, he grabs hold of the tube that is hanging out of Werner's arm and he starts pulling. As you can imagine, smarts a little. Now, Werner does the only thing I think a reasonable physician can do in this situation, which is decide to kick Peter really hard in the testicles. <laughs> <laughs> Peter hobbles off, <clears throat> and, and they take an x-ray. While he's away, they take an x-ray. I'm going to show you the x-ray. <clears throat> this is the actual x-ray they took that night. Werner Forsman won a Nobel Prize for the picture you're looking at. A Nobel Prize for medicine. I want to remind you that is a Nobel Prize won by breaking all the rules, trying to sleep with a colleague and kicking another colleague in the nuts. <laughs> <clears throat> you are what you do, not what you intend to do. And if you leave meaning and you don't do anything different, then today has been a waste. I think it's nicely summed up by Amelia Earhart. She said, the most effective way to do it is to do it. She also said this, never interrupt someone doing something you said was impossible. So maybe on a piece of paper or in your heads, just think about something you've been meaning to do, haven't quite got round to, something you should be doing in your business. I mean, I have, this, this sometimes backfires because quite a few people get divorced after this talk. Uh, <laughs> but we all talk about what we're going to do, how good are you at doing it, and score yourself. And how good is your leader allowing people to do what they say they're going to do? And how good is your organization? The next principle they all have in common is they understand that making mistakes is OK, but not trying is irresponsible. We all know that. that like, making mistakes is how we learn, isn't it? You, don't, you, can't, you can't learn uh, without making a mistake. 
And yet, as Carl was saying, we stigmatize mistakes at school, we stigmatize them at work, you get fired if you make a mistake, which is a bit weird, isn't it? You know, I mean, if I've got a baby boy, he's two years old, and he obviously has spent the last year learning to walk and run. And if I'd approached the way he did that and the way that most corporations approach their employees, it would be like, oh, you've fallen over. You're shit at walking. <laughs> you've done it again. You don't... Well, we're going to get you a chair. No, better still, we're going to get another child who can walk. You're fired. <laughs> That's how we treat most people. But it's ridiculous, isn't it? We have to make mistakes. And I think this is really nicely summed up by a great quote from uh, Keith Richards. And he was asked, how do you come up with those amazing riffs? He said, oh, I just start playing until I make the right mistake. Now, I think that's a really brilliant quote, because what he's saying there is, I am optimistic I'm going to get something wrong in the creation of something brilliant. And so we're going to play a game. Um, it's called Share a Mistake. <coughs> and uh, I'm going I'm to do it first. I'm going to share a mistake. So I fell in love. That wasn't a mistake. Uh, she's an amazing woman. Uh, but she's still kind of into her old boyfriend. And, um, and so she dumped me and went back out with him. You know, so that choice, fair enough. But I was pretty upset about it. Anyway, and I'm very upset, actually, because he was an arsehole. So <laughs> anyway, she worked that out quite quickly. And, uh, and she decided, actually, she, she did want to go out with me. So, she, so we got back together. But I had been hurt by the first sort of experience. You know, I thought, oh, God, you know, that really hurt me. So I played it cool. I thought, I'm not going to get so involved. I'm not going to let her know how much I care about her because I don't want to get hurt again. Which meant she thought I wasn't committed to the relationship, so she dumped me again. Which meant I lost the woman that I love twice. And what that taught me is that fear is hard, but regret is a fucker. Now, the third time around, she became my wife, so it all worked out okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you're just going to take a minute now, and you're going to turn to the person next to you, and you're going to say, here's something I did wrong, and this is what I learned, and then you're going to return the compliment. Got it? Wow. Off you go for a minute. <laughs> how, how did you find that? Anybody? Cathartic. cathartic. That's a good word. It is. It's good to hear that. And, and so one of the reasons it's cathartic is because it's a great learning experience, and you're kind of giving your learning to somebody else. And one of the things I do with a lot of the clients I work with, whether that's a corporation or NGO or government, is uh, we, do, um, we do this. We create awards for the best mistake. <laughs> and it's a really good way of changing the culture of a company to actually start embracing risky and innovative thinking. Because usually you kind of, oh, I don't want to do that because I might make a mistake and I might get fired. Now it's like, oh, well, I'm going to have a go at that because if I get it wrong, I might win a prize. You know? and, the, and the award ceremonies are great. Oh, you're really fucked up, Julie. Have a bottle of champagne. Uh, <laughs> obviously, if somebody makes the same mistake three times in a row, fire them. They're useless. But you know, this is a very good way of encouraging creative thinking. And uh, as, uh, as Catherine Hepburn said, look, if you obey all the rules, you're going to miss all the fun anyway. So how good are you at making mistakes? How good are you as a leader at allowing people to make mistakes? And how good is your organization? Now, there are some caveats to this, of course. You know, I don't suggest this to brain surgery students. You know, just go in and mess it up a bit today. So, you know, there are, you know, but in places like most of our jobs, which are sort of don't involve life and death situations, these kind of mistakes are really important. By the way, lots of surgeons have this kind of secret group where they do talk about their mistakes and share them, because they kill people all the time and just don't know about it. The, third, the next principle they have in common is engineering serendipity, smashing themselves into new ideas. And that's kind of what meaning is about. And in fact, there's some badges I think you've all, you know, that you can get out there which say engineer serendipity. And uh, this is basically about smashing yourself into as many new ideas as possible. Now, uh, you know, Carl was talking about children. One of my favorite quotes about children is, every child is an artist. The problem is we, 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 we have to remain one as we grow up. So those of you who've got kids, um, you'll have all had that moment when they're about four or five, and they'll come into the room that you're in, and they'll, they'll say something completely mind-blowing, right? Or they'll ask you a question. You go, fucking hell, how did you... That's incredible. Well, how did you come up with that observation? Okay? And, uh, you know, uh, and, and you're, going, you're going, oh, my God, my child's a genius. I can see the Nobel Prize already. Darling, you know, we've raised a genius. And kids come up with these amazing things, as Carl says, usually before they go to school. Now, why is this? It's because, well, educationists will tell you that kids are good at divergent thinking, linking separate ideas together. And, you know. Now, this is rubbish. Okay? Kids aren't good at divergent thinking. They're good at thinking. And we become shit at it because we go to school, where they crush all that out of us, as Carl was saying. And actually, one of the things you have to do is maintain that ability to smash yourself as many new ideas as possible, because that's where all the creativity comes from. Steve Jobs said this very famously. Creative people feel guilty because they didn't really do it. 
what he means is they spend all their time, you know, going around looking at different ideas. That eventually, that idea and that idea become like, well, just an obvious thing to do. So you've kind of got to be an intellectual slut. Okay? You've got to smash yourself into it. You've got to get your, your mind into as many idea orgies as possible. And you've got to let your employees and your staff do that. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of that happening, is this is Clay Marzo. So Clay um, uh, is, is this, can say, this amazing uh, surfer. And he came out of nowhere to win loads of uh, world championships in surfing. And people said, Clay, hey, who are your surfing heroes? Tell us about your surfing heroes. And who, who, who teaches you surfing? He says, I don't study surfing. He says, I study motocross. And I try and translate motocross moves into surfing moves, which is why I'm doing something you've never seen before. So there's this famous sort of you know, thing, but I do believe it's true. This is, what, this is what happens. So another thing I do with a lot of the people I work with is we create serendipity funds. Money and time to do random shit. Honestly, and it will boost the creativity of your mind. And I do this with my own wife, right? So um, we, we have this rule that every month we try and take the other one to something we think they're going to hate. <laughs> just to try and you know, get, get some new ideas in there. And, uh, and, I, and I just want to share a story. My, my wife took me, I'm not, this is no word of a lie, we have very different tastes in arts and culture. My wife took me to see a contemporary dance version of Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you know me, you will also know that that is literally hell on earth. That is the last place in the world I want to go and spend one of my free evenings. But because we have this deal, I said, no, I'm going to go away. Go, we might learn something from it. I loved it. I was pissed, but <laughs> preemptive strike. I thought, I'll get drunk first, it'll be fine. I loved it, but it also changed my life. Because I sat there, and I suddenly realized, it suddenly struck me watching those dancers, that they did everything athletes do in time to music and with elegance. And it made me think about the human body in a way I hadn't thought about it previously. And it made me think about my own body in contrast to those dancers. Now, perhaps I wasn't really doing what I should be with it. Now, I was out of shape. And as a direct result of that performance, a considerably slimmer version of me is now standing at the meeting conference than would have been if I hadn't gone. So, another quick game. Turn to the person next to you and recommend them. Give them a gift, something you think is awesome, something you like. Could be anything. Could be, love the last Black Sabbath album, got to listen to it. Could be, this, this came out of a workshop we did recently, uh, when you're at McDonald's, dip the chips in the milkshake. It's fantastic. Turns out it's really good, you know. <laughs> Could be try skydiving, but give a gift to the person. Actually, this is something that enriches my life. This is something that I like. I'm going to recommend you try it, and just do that. 30 seconds each. Off you go. <laughs> Hands up if you got something in that game. You thought, you know what? I am. I am going to try that. It sounds like okay. Right. Okay. Let's have some of these. Okay. What did you get? <laughs> running, running. Okay. Keep your hands up. What did you get, sir? That's also a little bit of criticism, isn't it? That's not fair, is it? That's, uh, what did you get, madam? Flying a helicopter. Flying a helicopter, you? Raw courgettes with hummus. Raw courgettes with hummus. I'm going to try that myself. You, sir. Hmm? Say again. I can't hear you. Shut up. Oh, the film. Right, the film. Okay, right. So look, like, as a result of just what one minute there. So people in this room are going to go and try something different. Just about, and we did that, in, and that could change your life. You might die flying that helicopter, who knows? But, you know, <laughs> if, you can t if you can create that much serendipity in a room, make that many changes in one minute, imagine what you could do if you embrace it as a concept in your business and in your life. So ask yourself, how good are you at engineering serendipity? How good is your, are you as a leader? And how good is your organization helping those things happen? Next principle is uh, think like an engineer, not like a politician. So um, one of the things I have learned from the work I do is that people divided by politics are very soon brought together around projects. You ask people to build stuff, and then politics tends to disappear. Look, you, know, you don't get bridges from a left-wing or a right-wing perspective, do you? You don't get Tory bridges and Labour bridges, or God help us, Liberal Democrat bridges. You, know, you get bridges that just get better and better over time because people are committed to evidence and working together in teams. They think like, when you think like an engineer, not like a politician, you get results. And my favorite example of this is the story of Michael Faraday demonstrating the Faraday core, which is the capturing of electricity, basically, for human use, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the day. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer said, hmm, Mr. Faraday, this electricity is very interesting, but what is it for? 
And he said, I don't know, Minister, but when we find out, you will tax it. <laughs> we remember the engineer, and we do not remember the politician. Now I'm going to show you, share with you the penultimate principle. This changed my life and, uh, and helped me to have a mortgage and become successful, actually. This is, I would say this is the most life-changing thing I learned. And it's about playing the long game. It's about how to lose. And it works like this. When you have a new idea for creating a more meaningful business, making the world a better place, whatever, when you try and introduce a new idea to a society or to an organization or anywhere, most people don't really want to engage with it for all the reasons we know. Now, I like to characterize it by saying, let's imagine you've got 10 people to convince, 10 investors, 10 people on the board of directors, 10 colleagues, 10 kids, whatever. You say to them, I've got this new idea. I've got this new idea for how our business could be more meaningful, how it can you know, be more sustainable, more humane, more equitable, more just. Can we try it? Now, what happens in most organizations when you come up with a new idea and introduce it to the organization? Exactly, something like that. Thank you for demonstrating. <laughs> Essentially, blank stares and people going, are you talking to me? No, I'm, I'm, we're not interested. But what happens is, is that maybe one person comes around. Now, this person was always crazy. This is the person you go drinking with. And you're sat in the pub with this person. You go, I don't understand why they didn't go for it. It's a good idea, you know. I had better faith in my colleagues. And then you go, oh, it's not their fault. It's my fault. It's my, it's my fault because I didn't present the idea well enough. It's a presentational issue. If they'd have heard me, surely they'd go for it. So clearly, they, I must have just fluffed the way I explained it to them. So you think, oh, I'll try it again. So you go back into that room and, uh, and you say, hey, look, look. What I meant was this. And they go, no, sorry, we heard you the first time. We're just not interested. By the way, it's not your pay grade to think about that stuff. And we're too busy doing the stuff we were doing yesterday to think about new things. So can you just stop and shut up and get back to what we pay you to do? Uh, but maybe one more person comes around. Now you're in the pub with two people. You still think it's a presentational issue. You think, I know what I'll do. I'll move from PowerPoint to Keynote. I'll change it from Arial to Helvetica. And they will definitely get it. You go in. One more person comes around. This is where you give up. This is where everybody gives up. It's where I used to give up all the time. Because by now, you might have been trying to get this new idea off the ground maybe for a month, two months, maybe six months. And 70% of the people you like and trust, these are your colleagues, your friends, your professional group, are telling you it's not going to work. And you're thinking, well, you know, if, if I, I, can, I can let this drop now with a clean conscience. I gave it my best shot. And you know what? If 70% of the people that are in my industry tell me this is not going to work, you know, I might as well give up and keep my job. And then a brilliant entrepreneur said to me something that changed my life. She said, Mark, that's not the time to give up. It's just a score. All it says is round three. And you have to get to round five. And then she said the thing that changed my life. She said, but if you are not prepared to lose more often than you win until halfway through the game, you will never achieve anything. If you are not prepared to lose more often than you win until halfway through the game, you will never achieve anything. But if you keep going to round five, suddenly this is what happens. And that's why I think a lot of people who've been on this stage today have embodied that ability to just keep it's nicely summed up, I think, by a quote from the guy who wrote The Sopranos. So he struggled for years as a scriptwriter in Hollywood. And then, of course, he went on to write The Sopranos and The Wire and became you know, very successful. And he said, basically, this, you know, this is what it is, is that the road to success is littered with corpses, but they are all suicides. When I'm working with you know, young companies, young entrepreneurs, I say, you know the moment you want to give up? Because everything's so hard. That's when all your competitors are. You have to keep going. So how good are you at playing that long game? Because we are in a long game to change this world, to be more meaningful and sustainable and equitable and just. I'm going to share with you the final principle that they all have, which is don't be cynical. Now, it's very easy to say, and it's very hard to do. Because we are born to be cynical. Okay? It's it wired into us. You know, only took, when we were all growing up on the African savanna, only took one member of your tribe or your family to go over a hill without checking for lions, get eaten by a lion, pretty cynical about hills from that moment on. We're always on the lookout for something that will hurt us or harm us before we're on the lookout for the opportunity after that. This is why the press always leads on the stuff that's miserable and upsetting, because they know it will get our attention. You know, 
we, and, and we're, we're the UK. I mean, we're you know, we pride ourselves on our cynicism, don't we, really? I mean, it's kind of like a, like a national thing. Yeah, we're great. We're very cynical. I mean, you come out of the womb in this country, and they go, oh, bad move. <laughs> it's terrible out here. It's much better in the past. And here's the Daily Mail, just to remind you how dreadful it's going to be and how at fault you are. So, but everybody I know who gets anything done is able to put that cynical voice to one side. It's probably eight times out of ten. They can't always do it. Because what cynicism is, is the ultimate enemy of our future. Because what it does is it dresses up your laziness as wisdom. It enables you to say, oh, I'm clever, I'm wise. Your idea won't work. Your idea is too hard. I, 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 I can do it. When people come to me for advice, I can come up with 10 reasons why their business idea won't work or their new uh, NGO uh, structure won't work. You know, oh, is, you know, you haven't got the right staff, the capital's not in place. I can, I, can just, I, can just, I can just come up with loads of ideas why new ideas won't work. You know, loads of reasons. And it's just me being lazy. Because if they're right, I'm going to have to change the way I think, and that's going to cost me effort. And what cynicism is, is a very nice way of dressing up your laziness as wisdom so that you can feel good about crushing somebody else's idea. And everybody I know who's successful says, fuck cynicism, I'm going to go and do it anyway. Cynicism is just obedience. It's obedience to the status quo. It makes you a lapdog. So, how good are you? How can you use policing your own cynicism? How can you as a leader in doing that for your staff? And how could your organization? Can these things be summed up by one idea? I think they probably can. I think it's probably a strap line for meaning. Is we have to be stopped. We have to stop being created, defined by what we own, which is what we've been told by capitalism. And we have to start being defined by what we create. And that, I think, is the spirit of meaning. Thank you very much for listening.